<clears throat> All right, my friends, welcome back. I uh, understand that much of what we did last time was troubling to you. Uh, and part of that is because we've changed the rules for Lewis structures. And um, what can I say? I think what we're seeing is the development of two branches of chemistry that sort of developed their own rules and then came together and had to start talking to each other. So the fact that we're dealing with electrons and formal charges in transition metal complexes a little bit differently than we've done before uh, for organic molecules, I think is the, the sticking point. So uh, let me try to make the process just a little bit easier. And by the way, I'm going to give you a periodic table so you don't have to memorize the number of valence electrons that each metal has. Okay, maybe somebody will re require that of your, you in your future, but uh, not me right now. Uh, so rule number one is you have to, uh, the charge has to be given to you. The charge on the complex has to be shown. And uh, if nothing, then you assume it's neutral. Okay, rule number two, the uh, electrons in metal ligand bonds belong to the ligand or uh, which is an L-type ligand or an X-type ligand. That's the thing that we, that's, that's the change, all right? All the electrons, both electrons in the metal ligand bond belong to the ligand. This is a difference, right? Because in Lewis structures with small molecules, we said, hey, an atom owns all of its lone pairs and half of the electrons in its bonds. But we're changing that now. Uh, that's why we would say, okay, this oxygen has a positive formal charge, all right? Uh, in contrast, with a ligand, we're saying both of the electrons in the bond belong to the ligand. So, uh, for example, if we look at this palladium complex, a charge isn't shown to you, so you know that it is neutral. Okay? Uh, we said before with this acetate ligand, uh, this bond represents lone pairs from the oxygen donating to the metal. Now notice the difference between that and what we have done previously. Before, when the carbonyl uh, had three bonds to oxygen, we would have put a positive formal charge on it, right? Even though in reality we knew that actually the real electron poor part of this molecule is that hydrogen and that carbon, right? We developed those rules sort of intuitively, but the formal charge was a way of keeping track of the electrons. We're not doing that here because the people that made the rules are assuming we all know what we're doing, which sometimes is not that great of an assumption, but we're trying to learn the rules and, and move along. The reason, one of the reasons why we don't put a positive formal charge on that oxygen is because in order to balance out, uh, in some cases, in order to balance out the positive formal charge on the oxygen, we would need two negative formal charges on the metal, but that doesn't make any sense because that would tell us that the metal is super electron rich and actually chemically it doesn't behave that way. So in this case, formal charge can be misleading uh, in ways that are difficult to rationalize. And, and in some ways, it was misleading before, right? Oxygen is not electron poor there. We put a positive formal charge to keep track of the electrons and to count, but we know the real electron poor spots, as I said, are this carbonyl and that hydrogen. So um, 
to avoid that situation with the metals, we simply are not going to put formal charge on the atoms. Okay, The overall charge on the complex has to be correct, but we're not going to put formal charges on the ligands. So, uh, what do we do when we see something like this? Well, okay, this, these electrons uh, came from a lone pair on the carbonyl, so this is an L-type ligand. If we were to break this bond, the carbonyl oxygen would leave uh, as a neutral group. The electrons in this bond come from this oxygen, and if that oxygen left with these electrons, it would have to be negatively charged, right? So this is an X-type ligand. And we can say the same thing over here. This is an L-type ligand. This is an X-type ligand. Um, questions so far? Okay. Similarly, over here, you've got this palladium complex, and this looks horrible. Uh, but if we look, the, the electrons here in this bond between phosphorus and the metal belong on phosphorus, belong to phosphorus, and if this left, it would leave as the neutral triphenylphosphine ligand. So that's an L-type ligand. Uh, so is that. Bromine, if it left, if it took these electrons that it owns and left, it would leave as Br minus. So that's an X-type ligand. Uh, the phenyl group, if it left with these electrons, would leave as sort of this phenyl anion. That's an X-type ligand. Uh, we learned last time that pi bonds can also coordinate the metal, and that's an L-type ligand. Now, this one is really weird. Uh, and it's a, it's, I struggle to know what to do with it because the organometallic chemists will full on draw a bond there, but they will understand that this doesn't represent an electron pair. This just represents the pi bond, the pi electrons donating into the metal. How about that, huh? All right, so uh, that's why. I think I will draw that kind of thing with a dotted line so that we know that it's the pi electrons that are donating to the metal. So, um, <clears throat> therefore what, right? Once you can identify which electrons belong to the ligands, then you're able to identify the oxidation state of the metal, and that's important for um, understanding some of the mechanisms. So, uh, we first ask, okay, take the ligands away from palladium, what's its charge going to be? Each of these ligands overall has one negative charge, and we've got two of them. So to be neutral, palladium must have a two plus charge, or it must be in the plus two oxidation state. When metals are in their zero oxidation state, they own the number of valence electrons that they come with. So when palladium, palladium zero comes with uh, 10 D electrons, palladium two therefore has to come with eight D electrons. You see that? Now, um, why do we care about the number of D electrons? Well, that's not such a big issue. Uh, if you can identify the oxidation state of the metal, you're, you're pretty well fine. Uh, but sometimes it's useful to just make sure, to get a sense for the chemistry of the complex, it's useful to make sure or to, to calculate how many electrons are being shared, either owned by the metal or being shared with the metal. So in this case with palladium, you have uh, eight electrons from the palladium two itself, and then you have, let's see, two, four, six, eight electrons uh, from the ligands. So overall, this is a 16 electron complex. 
And that can tell you something about what other chemistry is possible. Uh, you have an 18 electron rule for the, for the transition metal row of the periodic table because you, you've got valence orbitals are the s, the three p orbitals, and then all of the d orbitals, which, at, with, which two electrons each gives you 18 electrons. So if we saw this complex, uh, 16 electrons, we might say, hey, we could put another ligand on there and the metal would be fine. We wouldn't break the octet rule if we put another ligand on there. Okay. Anything you want to ask about that? I know there are questions. I know some of you are very frustrated by this. Go ahead. So we got the plus two charge because there were two X ligands? Exactly. We got the plus two charge because there were two X ligands. Yeah? Um, so on Monday we said the early metals here are electron poor because they have not that many d electrons. The ones that are late are electron rich. That has, to, I mean, I don't think that has anything to do with anything you'll need to know. Um, we will see the use of early transition metals as oxidizing agents because they are electron poor. We will see them as Lewis acids because they are electron poor. Uh, the later transition metals we will see doing chemistry where you have to use temporarily a pair of electrons from the metal, and that's why they're good at that. Yeah? So for the palladium complex on the left, how did you know which one was L and which one was X? How did I know which one was L or which one was X? Well, I think uh, by resonance, right, I could have, uh, either one of these oxygens could have been the, um, well, first, okay, sorry. The, the ligand is acetate, which means the negative charge is actually shared between both of those oxygens, but we're going to count one as being donating lone pairs <clears throat> and the other as being negatively charged and donating lone pairs. So actually, you, you don't necessarily know. You just know one is X and one is L. Yeah. Would it be able, could it be in resonance while it's in the complex? Could it be in resonance while it's in the complex? You bet. And actually, if you want to do this, and some people do it, and that gets even worse at keeping track of electron pairs, you totally can. And in that case, all you would know is that one is X and one is L. Or you could, yeah, so... Uh, I don't particularly like that. I have to undo all my little dots. But that's the idea. Okay, what else? Okay, so let's get to the therefore what, because there's really cool chemistry enabled by uh, the transition metals. And so we were looking at the mechanism of this reaction, the cuprate coupling reaction. Uh, I showed you some of these at the beginning of uh, class last time. Cuprate coupling. And this chemistry uh, does, it gives you access to things that you couldn't otherwise do. Uh, so here is the cuprate and its counter ion lithium. Then you add the... Uh, bromobenzene and the product is you make a new bond between benzene and the alkyl group and then you also have this neutral complex and Br minus. So what's going on there? Uh, and the mechanism we showed last time. So uh, basically, you have what's called an oxidative addition step. Now, if we went ahead and reminded ourselves that both of those carbons are X-type ligands, then uh, that would help us realize that in order to have a negative charge, 
this must be, copper must have a positive one charge. Do you see how to balance that out? Two negative charges on the x's. We need a total charge of negative one. So to compensate for both of those negative charges from the x-type ligands, copper needs to have a plus one. Okay. And then if we go and look at the transition metals, okay, we can say that copper, if we want to, copper came with 10. Copper one has 10 D electrons. All right. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take an electron pair from copper and uh, most of the time people will not draw the d electrons but this is one of the this is one pair of the d of the 10 d electrons <clears throat> and we're going to make a new bond with carbon and at the same time we're going to uh, make a new bond between carbon I'm sorry, between copper and bromine with the electrons from uh, <clears throat> this carbon-bromine bond. Okay. Now, it turns out that the reason some people don't push arrows uh, for this kind of thing is because you really can't tell whether it's this way or alternatively... this way. You, you really can't tell, and either way is fine. Um, but since we're used to the idea of bromine being sort of a leaving group, it, it, it's, more, it's more comfortable for me to draw the arrows this way. If you were to draw a transition state for this reaction, what it would look like is here's copper, Here's the X-type carbon ligands, and here's the benzene ring, and here's, oops, sorry. Here is the bond between uh, carbon and, ben and bromine that's breaking. Here is a new bond between copper and bromine that's forming. And here is the new bond between copper and carbon that's forming. Okay, and you've actually seen transition states like this before. This should look similar to like the epoxidation reaction. Um, and so, yeah, overall the transition state would have a negative charge and I'm gonna just put this with the double dagger to indicate that this is a transition state. Um, so the transition state involves the carbon bromine bond breaking and two new copper ligand bonds forming. Now uh, that's significant because once we get the benzene ring on the metal, there are other things we can do with it. So uh, I'll draw for you, well, I've drawn for you here, uh, the complex after, I don't like all of the colorful stuff here, sorry. We're going to erase, I should have just drawn it fresh, right? Um, here's the complex we have after that step. Now, again, we have X-type ligand here, X-type ligand there. X-type ligand here. You can tell they're X-type because they would leave with a negative charge if they took those electrons with them. So we have four X-type ligands, four sort of negative charges, but the complex overall has one negative charge. So to balance that out, then copper needs to be plus three. And now copper, instead of being D10, is D8. Why did copper lose two electrons? Because we took two D electrons from copper and we made a new bond with the benzene ring. And as soon as we did that, we're counting those electrons now as being owned by the benzene ring. So copper formally lost two electrons. Okay. Because of that, this reaction is an addition reaction because we're adding uh, uh, two groups to copper but it's called oxidative addition 
because in order to make those two new bonds, we have to take two electrons from copper and give them to the ligand formally. And so copper goes from 1 to 3, or from D10 to D8. All right? Questions about that? So we lose track of, uh, of the electrons for sure. I mean, it would be nice to be able to say, okay, well, these are the two electrons that came from copper. These are the ones that came from bromine. And it's fine if we do that, but um, it's, you can't experimentally figure that out. All right. So if this were all there was to it, you know, it'd be, okay, great. You just made a new complex. The key, though is that once uh, we get that phenyl group on the benzene ring, we can do what's called a reductive elimination. And what's going to happen here is that the, and I'll draw the transition state, uh, the X ligand that's the alkene is going to start leaving. And this bond with copper is going to get longer. And at the same time, the bond between copper oops, and the phenyl group is going to start increasing in length. And at the same time, these two carbons are going to start getting closer together. So this is sort of the opposite of an oxidative addition where we just uh, moved the benzene and the bromine up to the metal and split them apart. Now we're doing a reverse of that, but with the other carbon ligand. So we're taking the benzene and the alkyl group and moving them off the metal, but closer to each other. Okay. Um, if you wanted to push arrows, you could do something like this. You could have the benzene group leave with its electrons and then form a new bond with carbon. And then you could have the electrons in the bond between the alkyl group and copper go back onto copper. It would be just fine to do it the opposite way. That is to have electrons here attack the benzene ring and have these go back to copper. Um, this would be the transition state, and your product is going to be to have a new sig oops, sigma bond between your benzene ring and your alkyl group. And then what you're left behind with is a complex in which you still have an alkyl group and you still have a bromine. Uh, it's still negatively charged. And if you want, we can show, oh, those two electrons that used to be in the bond with the X-type ligand are now on copper. Uh, but now we're back to a D10 complex. We've got two X-type ligands. Uh, in order to have one negative charge, it has to be copper 1. So we went from something that was copper 3 back to copper 1. This is called reductive elimination because copper gets its electrons back. And what's getting eliminated? These two groups, the alkyl group and the benzene ring, and we make that new bond. Okay? Yes? Why those two specific ligands? Why those two specific ligands instead of the two carbons? I don't know. Uh, presumably, uh, these steps are reversible, right? Be uh, well, yeah, that's a great question, and I don't have a good answer to it. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> it's a good question. Um, what else? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What would make the phenyl group want to attack it? Yeah, so what would make the phenyl group want to attack it since these are both X-type ligands? 
And the answer is you can't think of this in terms of a normal SN2 reaction. It's not. Basically what happens is that both of these ligands start to move away from the metal. You make a new bond with two of the electrons and the other two electrons get left behind with copper. So pushing arrows is just a way to keep track of electrons, but, but it's not exactly SN2. But the other reason is just you have this metal sink that the electrons can go into. Yeah. All right. Yes? That's okay. Oh, wow, that is a great question. Do the ligands have to be adjacent to each other, or do, um, do can any of them do this? I think to do the reductive elimination, they have to be next to each other. And sometimes you'll see some moving around of ligands on the complex to get in that situation, but that's that's beyond what I know, so sorry. You know what, you, yeah, but you don't see, you don't necessarily see um, reductive elimination this way. Well, okay, what you're getting to is this idea of catalysis. Can you go backwards or forwards? Does the metal facilitate things? And uh, it seems reasonable to me that um, if you can do oxidative addition to get to this complex, you could probably do reductive elimination to get back here. And so the issue as to whether it goes forward or backwards or who interacts with what is probably an issue of thermodynamic stability. Yeah? Yeah, so could you have this do it again? What will happen usually at this stage is that the, the bromine can leave and you get a neutral um, copper complex. In order to go again, you would need to recharge that copper with an X-type ligand. I'm not totally sure how to do that, but that's what you'd need to do. Yeah? Uh, yeah, is the copper higher or lower in energy um, in plus three? Um, removing electrons from a metal, I think, takes energy, but the way that people think about this for redox reactions is you can look up reduction potentials that tells you how high uphill this is. Uh, now, to some extent, that's going to be compensated for by the stability of the new bonds that you make, and so... Um, so it's difficult for me to say how high in energy this intermediate is. I don't have that intuition like I do for carbocations. Yeah. Okay, what else? All right, so let's get to the, uh, let's get to the famousest of the organometallic reactions. Uh, these are palladium type reactions. And the one we're going to learn about first is the Suzuki reaction. And it's a coupling reaction, and I'll show you sort of starting materials, uh, reagents, and products, and then we will deal with the mechanism. All right, so you take um, <clears throat> an aryl halide, and a weird molecule called uh, an this is called a vinyl borane we'll talk about where to make the how to make these but uh, for right now this is sort of a new reagent aryl halide vinyl uh, borane and you use palladium with uh, triphenylphosph four triphenylphosphine ligands. And you make a new bond between benzene ring and vinyl group. And uh, you regenerate the catalyst. 
And then I suppose the other thing you would make is you'd have the the bromine on that boron. Okay. So, but the key is you make a new bond here between this carbon here and this carbon there. And interestingly enough, stereochemistry of the vinyl group uh, stays. And, and actually, I should be clear about this. This is a functional group called a boronic acid, uh, but it could be a boronic ester as well. <clears throat> Before we talk about the catalytic cycle, it might be a good idea to just get a sense for the substrate specificity. Um, you can have, I, I believe in the Suzuki reaction, the bromide part has to be aryl, and the boronic acid part can be vinyl or it can be aryl as well. Okay, um, so maybe let's show you the catalysis. Uh, and what people do typically is they'll draw out a catalytic cycle uh, that shows all of the changes that are happening. All right, so the first thing that happens in the process is that you start with palladium tetrakis triphenylphosphine, and we've already analyzed this complex before. We know that uh, it's palladium zero, and that palladium zero has, scrolling up, 10 D electrons, okay? Uh, the first thing that happens is just ligand dissociation. So we're going to lose two of the triphenylphosphine ligands. And that's going to get us to here. And this is actually the active catalyst. The reason we have to lose two triphenylphosphine ligands is we're going to do an oxidative addition, and we need a place for the we need a place two spots for the um, bromide and the aryl and the aryl group to go. <clears throat> All right, so this is called, the loss of the two uh, triphenylphosphines is called ligand dissociation. And before we go any further, I know there's been some concern about uh, the syllabus and the fact that I intended to get through both chapters 29 and 30 before the end of the semester. That is clearly not happening. Uh, we will take as long as we need on this subject and what we don't get to, I will mourn in my heart that I didn't get to tell you, but you won't be responsible for. Is that okay? All right. So this is the active catalyst. <clears throat> the first step is an oxidative addition step. We're going to bring in the phenyl bromide and that's going to generate our complex in which we have still the two triphenylphosphine ligands, a BR, and a phenyl group. Okay, that's our oxidative addition. And we can note that we go from something that was palladium zero to something that, was, that is still palladium, well, that is now palladium two, because you have two X-type ligands and the complex is neutral, all right? Uh, I'm not pushing arrows for you on this process, but if I did, it would look like electrons from the metal attack the phenyl group and then electrons from the bromo go attack the metal, all right? Okay, um, the next step involves something called, let's see, uh, okay, I want to draw a mechanism, but I also want the catalytic cycle to be pretty, so uh, you'll hopefully forgive me for doing too much of this stuff. All right, so 
we have electrons on palladium attack the benzene carbon and then we have electrons from the carbon from the carbon bromine bond go attack the metal and that's our oxidative addition step both of these are x type ligands <clears throat> Okay, the next step is a new reaction that we haven't talked about yet. Um, it's called transmetallation. And that's swapping of ligands from one metal to another. Except I don't know how to spell transmetallation. So this is where our boronic acid reagent comes in. Uh, now, mechanistically, what's going on is you've got a boron here with your two uh, OH groups. This is a boronic acid. And then you have your bond with your vinyl group. And all that's going to happen is we're going to have uh, electrons from this boron carbon bond attached to the metal at the same time as Br is going to leave and attach to the boron. So this is literally lining up side by side and just swapping. Okay, and if you were to look at the transition state, what would it look like? Um, it would look something like this, dot, dot, dot there, dot, dot, dot there. Dot, dot, dot there, dot, dot, dot there. We're just trading who's bonded to whom. Um, so I'm going to just undo all of that and show the arrow pushing to keep us on track. This is an X-type ligand. So yeah, you're making a new bond with palladium and a new bond between bromine and boron. So what we often do, at least when drawing a catalytic cycle in this case, is we'll show the boron reagent coming in and it's going to leave with the bromine. Okay, and the product of that is going to be where we now have two alkyl groups on the metal. Why can't I draw triphenylphosphine? My brain never wants to do that. So now we have our vinyl group on the benzene ring. I'm sorry, on the palladium, and we have our benzene ring on the palladium. They are both still X-type ligands. The complex is still neutral, so this is still palladium 2. All right. Questions about that step, the transmetallation? Oh, goodness. Why is that still there? <laughs> yes? Why is it called transmetallation? Well, we're pretending that boron is an honorary metal. It's one row up from aluminum, which is a metal. Uh, frankly, the definition, be, the, the dividing line between metals and metalloids and nonmetals is kind of funny, and we don't worry about it. We're treating boron as if it were a metal, and so we're swapping ligands from one group to another. But we'll see similar steps. There are similar steps in other areas of organometallic chemistry where this group actually is a metal. Okay, what else? Yeah? Why did you need to make room for those two if, if you have the 18 Right. So, uh, if, uh, so let's see. Palladium 2 has eight D electrons and then eight electrons from ligands. So that's a 16 electron complex. Yeah, the question is why did we, why couldn't we just have dropped this guy off and then it could be an 18 electron complex. 
I think uh, that would be fine, although that would give you a negatively charged, you'd be delivering an X ligand to a neutral complex, so it would be negatively charged, and then the boron, which is already electron poor, would be left with a positive charge. Yeah? Well, I did that in the step before that, when we dropped off the two. Oh, why did we draw, oh, okay, sorry about that. Why did we drop these two off? Um, <clears throat> I think it's for a similar reason. Uh, if there would be space for, uh, oh, actually, no, as it's D10, the metal is D10 and then 2, 4, 6, 8. So this already is an 18 electron complex. So you have to lose something before you can add something else. Yep. OK. What else? Um, huh? Yeah. So it's with the final boron that has the interaction Well, so the the question is, it's significant that the. Vinyl boronic acid not only delivers the carbon bond to palladium, but also the bromine to boron. Yeah, I mean, if you think about boron and what this reagent would look like, remember boron, when it's neutral, has an empty p orbital, so it's electron poor. And so it seems unreasonable for something that's already electron poor to lose a carbon and then go to something like this. when it could be neutral and much happier or more stable if it just took the bromine with it. So yeah, I think the reason you take the bromine with you is to avoid, avoid the formation of that, which would be a very reactive complex or very reactive molecule. Okay, what else? Yeah? Could it take something besides bromine? Could it take something besides bromine? Uh, that sounds reasonable, but I... Um, but that is a question beyond my knowledge, so don't know. Yeah? So is the driving force for all of these uh, metal chemical interactions the fact that like the reduction potential of the metal? Is that the so is the driving force the reduction potential of the metal? No, because we're going to regenerate the metal catalyst. And so thermodynamically, in terms of the metal, it's neutral. Uh, the driving force is going to be the stability of the bonds we make versus the bonds we broke. Um, and we'll, <clears throat> we'll look at that. But in the end, what we see, like, I guess up here, we're replacing a boron carbon bond and a carbon bromine bond with a carbon carbon bond and then a boron bromine bond. And, and presumably this works because the bonds you make are more stable than the bonds you broke. We could look up the, uh, uh, the uh, enthalpy of formation of these various bonds and see whether we come out ahead, but, but, but we do. Um, otherwise, it wouldn't work. Okay, what else? So let's finish the reaction at this point. Um, I should have drawn my circle a little bit differently because all that's left is reductive elimination. And in this, this is the step where we're going to lose the both uh, carbon ligands. We make this new bond. If you want to push arrows, you could show benzene attacking this carbon and then these electrons going back on palladium. Uh, you could draw them the other way. But that gets you back to this complex where uh, you now are back to palladium zero. Uh, you can tell it's palladium zero because the complex is neutral. <laughs> Uh, and it has only two L-type ligands, so palladium must be neutral as well. So uh, that's the catalytic cycle, which means you don't actually need a full equivalent of palladium to make this work. 
you only need a catalytic amount, which is fortunate because palladium is expensive. Um, but this thing just cranks until you're out of starting material. Um, unfortunately, it's somewhat difficult to recover the catalyst after the reaction, and, the, and people are sort of working on ways to do that better. But this is a reaction that's greatly enabled um, pharmaceutical chemistry. Uh, because palladium is so valuable, there have been a lot of people working on a metal-free Suzuki reaction, and there's actually an interesting story in organic chemistry. There were some labs that said, hey, we got this to work without any metal at all. And other labs were like, come on, that's ridiculous. And it turns out that they thought it was without metal because they didn't add any palladium to the reaction, but they were using glassware that they had used palladium on before. And so there was residual palladium on the glassware. <laughs> and this was, the small amount that was left was good enough to make the reaction go. And so they had to either retract papers or publish additional papers saying, well, we were sort of wrong. This is how science works, and it's, it's, it, but it's awesome that this reaction works so well that you don't actually need to add the palladium. You can just have a, a hint of palladium residual in your flask, and the reaction goes. Um, okay, so let me show you just a couple of uh, variations on the Suzuki reaction. You can use... Uh, boronic esters instead of boronic acids. And so uh, what's a boronic ester? Well, if you take uh, phenyl lithium and react it with uh, this methyl boronic ester, you get... And the mechanism of this reaction isn't important. We're not going to talk about it. Your text does show you how to do this. Presumably, then, you have methoxide and lithium as counter ions. But this is how you load uh, the boronic ester with uh, the benzene ring. OK? Um, presumably, these electrons dump into the uh, p orbital on bromine or on boron and then uh, you get a negatively charged complex and then methoxide leaves. Presumably that's what's going on. The other way you can generate a boronic ester is to start with some kind of alkyne and then pull out a reaction. It needs to be a terminal alkyne then pull out a reaction from 351. This is a uh, hydroboration reaction. And what this will do is convert your alkyne into this lovely boronic ester. So a couple different ways you can make these things. But beyond that, you just need an aryl halide on one part and then an aryl, and then an aryl or vinyl boronic ester on the other part. So now you can start to look at more complicated molecules and try to think retrosynthetically, how would I make this? And whenever you see a bond between two aryl carbons, you could be thinking light bulb. I could have made that through the Suzuki reaction. And uh, I don't actually know what the principles are for deciding whether which side should be the boronic ester and which side should be the uh, alkyl halide. I don't think it matters that much. Okay. So we will, I will see you next time, and uh, 
We're going to play loosey-goosey with how far we get. Whatever we don't get to won't be on the test. <laughs>